the announcements are printed in the bulletin, uh, and you can use that as your reference. I do want to mention a couple. The United Methodist men meet Monday at 6 p.m. Church Council will be meeting Tuesday at 6.30 p.m., and both of those meetings are hybrid. The United Women in Faith will meet Saturday at 11, 8, 11 o'clock in the sanctuary. March is Women's History Month. This history is vast. Women have been in the forefront, leading beside others and behind the scenes in all areas, including politics, education, medicine, and entertainment, and others. Sometimes those behind the scenes have been just as instrumental in influencing us as any others. We all know about the ones such as Eleanor Roosevelt, Rosa Parks, Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey, but those behind the scenes, we rarely get to meet them and know who they are. And there are many. They are just as influential. They prepare the meals, give encouragement, and lift and support us when we need it. Women in the past for Silver Hill have been just as instrumental in keeping the church going by paying bills, uh, feeding the hungry, and giving whatever the support has been needed by anyone associated with the church. The Women's Guild in the past did this, then it became the United Methodist Women, uh, which is now United Women in Faith which primarily focuses on women, youth, and children. We are a group of women interested in the outreach of the church and in mission work. I invite all women, you don't have to be Methodist, to come out and learn about United Women in Faith. And as I mentioned, you don't have to be Methodist, you can be Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever it is, and still be a part of the mission of the church. I'd like for us to all stand for the call to worship. It's printed in your bulletins. Welcome to our worship. Greetings to our brothers and sisters. We come to celebrate God's presence. And God's love is expressed through Jesus Christ. We come remembering Christ's life and ministry. And the life of here all to live. We come as a pilgrim, people searching for ways to live out all of faith. We promise to seek the strength to carry on our journey. Let us rejoice in God's gift to us. We now have our hymn of celebration. You may be seated. Be patient with us.
hold of reference, we remember irreplaceable women, oh God. We honor those who nurtured us and taught us to honor and love you, oh God. May the example of the Christian faith help transform us into your image. We honor women who feed the hungry, clothe the unclothed, befriend the lonely, and comfort the comfortless. We bless them for unselfishly loving your people as you love us. May you continue to meet their needs as they minister to others. We honor women grieving the loss of loved ones. May you, O oh God, continue to comfort them with your word, spoken and blessed. May we learn to encourage them as they have encouraged us. We honor women pregnant with your unborn, unborn sons and daughters, O oh God. May you shelter them and the children that they are in the shadow of your almighty presence. We honor our sisters throughout the world who need your spiritual, economic, and physical healing. May you meet their needs, Holy One, according to your riches and glory and We honor all the women who have gone before us, named and unnamed. We give thanks to so God. We bless those who wept for us, rejoiced with us, wiped our tears, prayed for us, and laughed with us. We give thanks to so God. Bless those who undoubtedly sacrifice for us. We give thanks to God. We honor all those who stand alongside, and for these women, we bless those who encourage them to dream, who bring out the best in them, who help them bear their burdens, and who love them rightly, O oh God. May you keep all of you. These women and all who love them. But I will read for us today our gospel lesson. It's from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. It's a lot of verses, so bear with me this morning, please. And it reads, As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud of the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sin. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. The Pharisees investigated him. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He had put mud on my eyes. 
Then I watched, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What did you say about him? Because your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah will be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Verse 24 says, So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they revived, reviled him. Thank you, yes. Excuse me. Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are his disciples of Moses. We are disciples of Moses. We know that that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened his eyes, opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you were trying to teach us, and they drove him out. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he had found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do not do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise God. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Y'all hear me okay? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with us with the technology. And so it's different to be back in the space. I know we worship here for a little bit during the pandemic and different things, and it's nice to be flexible. So it reminds me of the good old days back in the day, but I don't know if some of y'all remember the tent revivals and tent worship services. So sometimes I would go to those and stuff. So, but we're not in the tent, of course. Uh, we are grateful for this space. And I'm grateful to be standing before you this morning and uh, in, a, in the absence of our pastor, Reverend Dr. Sheila Elliott Hodge. And uh, I'm just so grateful that you invited me back. I've been away for a little bit and um, I've been working at Central United Methodist Church. And so the church services happen at different times. So, But I'm so grateful to be among you today and to be worshiping with you. I want to reread um, just a little bit because I know it's a lot of verses, okay? And so, um, let's see. I just want to reread two verses from John chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or his parents, excuse me, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. I offer you, brothers and sisters, redefine. We are more than what we appear to be. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this day and this time to gather in your house one more time. Lord, you are so good to us. And Lord, we are grateful. And your name is worthy to be praised. Lord, as we prepare for your word, prepare our hearts and minds, and Lord, we ask that whatever is said here today will glorify you, Lord. And Lord, speak to me, speak through me to your people. And Lord, we think of those who are suffering in so many ways, Lord, that we may not know, but you know. These are all the things we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tonda, for being worship leader this morning. I don't know if some of y'all know, but Tonda and I are cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Carmen, our other sister. I had a bit of other sister. I talked to her all the time. But we're cousins through um, her mother and my great grandmother were cousins. So, and uh, her mother is how old? Her mother? Ninety-five. Ninety-five. So my great grandmother, who was a little bit older, but she's deceased, but we're cousins. So happy to say that. So, um, of course, I'm in school, and one of my professors at the seminary uh, teaches at the seminary. I won't say her name. But she always asks us when we go into a meeting or a meeting, one thing she says, who do you bring into the space with you? So with it being Women's History Month, I bring my mother, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, um, other women who wanted to maybe be in the pulpit or, or could be, maybe were not allowed the opportunity for whatever reason. But like as we read in our uh, litany earlier, who nurtured all of us, different ways to not just be in the pulpit but serve you know in different ways and use our gifts in different ways so I'll bring that. So with the in line of the uh, sermon series that pastor has for us redefine so we all hear that word we know that word but what does it mean so I looked it up in the Miriam dictionary uh, it says to reformulate re-examine you know they have all these different words and Reevaluate, especially with a view to change. But one word they had in there that said transform. So let's bring that to light for us today in our context. COVID 19, we know it redefined life for us. Remember? Even church, not just the building or the place we come to worship every Sunday or Wednesday night, right? But it redefined how we continue to worship, how we continue to do ministry. But we didn't stop being the church, but it was redefined. We're back in the gym space, worshiping again, but we're grateful to have this space. Redefined. 
for all of you Marvel or superhero people that love superheroes, usually the superheroes are normal people that lead normal lives, right? We have Tony Stark, who becomes Iron Man, then Dr. Bruce Banner, who becomes Incredible Hulk whenever he's called upon, right? Redefined. So I'll bring this into context of my uh, life and my experiences. I had a theological conversation with my youngest son, and y'all know me, so y'all know my youngest son. <laughs> On yesterday, well not yesterday morning, last week when I was driving to school, and I was talking to him about learning and how important education is. And you know what he told me? He told me, Mommy, you don't have to be in school to learn. I couldn't answer, I couldn't say anything to that because he was right. He was exactly right. <laughs> that was a theological conversation. Then this week, it's like, as you know, God will place you in situations that uh, you don't expect, but you know that God placed you there, right? So this week I was at the bridge. How many of you have heard of the bridge? Okay, okay. it's a ministry, you know, Okay, it's a ministry um, that First Baptist Church of Spartanburg has for our community. And what they do there, I don't want to insult what they do by not saying enough, but uh, they provide food for people there. They do other things, right? We have different churches that have different ministries. That's one of their ministries. So I met a woman, I won't say her real name, but kind of similar to her name. Uh, so it's the month of March, I'll say Miss Aku Marie. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's the first dollar for March. So Ms. Alvin Moraine, who God placed uh, at the table or in that particular space with me, she and I had a theological conversation, like I did with my youngest son this week. So, because, you know, I was thinking when uh, Pastor Hodge invited me to speak, I didn't know what direction I was going. I knew the scripture, didn't know. But God gave me this and those conversations I had this week. So Ms. Aquin Marie, uh, Marine, who I consider a womanist theologian, okay, she did not quote Bible verses, and you know we're in the South, so you know the first question we ask each other, what church you go to, who's your name? We didn't say it. But she didn't quote Bible verses, but we talked about church, but not a whole lot, but it was a theological conversation. She talked to me about different things in life, and I don't know her full story, but I do know that she taught me that day, redefined. I don't know her educational background, anything like that. But what stood out to me when she said, some things of life we are not meant to know. We're not meant to understand. Some questions we don't have answers to. Some things we cannot explain. So we'll remember that whenever our children ask us questions we don't know the answer. So in our gospel lesson this week from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41, there's a blind man. He's blind from birth. Notice he does not have a name. So most male characters, as we know, in the Bible have names. So, but he's only identified by his disability or his condition, which is blindness. Just like the miracle story in John chapter 5, when Jesus heals a man, that was sick for 38 years. We don't know his name either. He says the man that was ill for 38 years. Maybe the gospel writer does this intentionally. So you say, why would he do that? So we can see ourselves or someone we know in this person. Jesus sees the man in a different way. And we know this because Jesus says he was born blind. Remember the uh, scripture, the verse I read earlier. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. And that was in verse 3. Jesus right away redirected the way that they saw the man and his purpose. He was redefined. Let's go back to uh, verse 4. It says, we must work the works of him who sent me. Wow, it is a day and night is coming when no one can work. So, Jesus redefined this man's, how he saw or seen right away. So what does this gospel lesson mean for us today, right now, 2023? So let's look at John, 
verse, chapter 9, verse 1 and 4. So Jesus saw him. Everyone else saw him too because they were asking questions about him. It's in the scripture. It says, as he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, so they started asking questions. But like the sister saying earlier, and I love that because that was part of what I was going to say and what y'all were singing, but Jesus really saw him. He saw him not just with his eyes. He saw him with his heart. He saw the man. So who can we see that no one else can see in our community? Not just with your eyes, right, but with your, your heart, your spirit. See them. Remember, we are not what we appear. Remember that was part of our title this morning. God sees us in ways others may not redefine. And that's John chapter 9, verse 4. So, like what I read earlier. Work with what you have. That's the next point. In verse 6, it tells us, when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes. Jesus didn't go out and buy nothing. He didn't go to a store. He worked with what he had. And that's a message to us. Jesus used what he had available to heal the man. What, how, or what we have to be redefined, excuse me, how can we use what we have to redefine or transform the lives of others? We have like the space, different things. There's so many ways I'm not like saying that's what we gotta do for you, but I'm just, you know, give me an example. And others may see in us what we do not see in ourselves. After meeting Jesus, the man had a new name. He was redefined as a disciple. The word tells us. In verse 28, it says, Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. So before, remember, they called him blind, the blind man. But here, he's, they see him as a disciple. And remember the sister I talked about, Miss Arthur Marine. Some things we can't explain, especially the ways of God. When God acts in our lives, and all of us have examples of how God's been active in our lives that we cannot explain. The blind, or the man in the story, he could explain what Jesus did, how he healed him, he described everything, but he couldn't explain where he was. Remember, they were asking, where is he? He said, I don't know. They were asking him all kinds of questions. What did he say? I don't know. And what ways can we be in community with others where they can see Jesus, not us, but see Jesus after interacting with us. Verse 11. He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. So he was immediately, he was transformed by that. And after interacting with us, how many people would want a relationship or want to have a relationship with Jesus? Verses 37 and 38 says, Jesus said to him, you have seen him and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. So he had this interaction with Jesus. And so if people interact with us and they see Jesus, would they want to have a relationship, not be a member of a church or a certain denomination, but want a relationship with Jesus? Get to know people and their stories. Uh, when Sister Tonda read earlier in our litany about the different women or different people that help and do things in the community, feed the hungry, uh, clothe people, do different things, serve. Okay, so we know that these are people that see people in a different way, see their experience. They see them. So in verses 8 and 9, it says the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, so they're not saying anymore the blind man, the blind man is saying now, uh, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? So they're identified as different. Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. 
So what I'm trying to say is, you know, he had changed, God had changed, or Jesus had changed him. He changed him by healing his eyes. But then they were still labeling him. They were labeling him as a beggar instead of who Jesus saw him as. God has revealed to each of us in different ways, so we cannot define that for other people. So, and that's, you know, like different experiences. People have different experiences. So in verse 17, it says, so they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. So this is the way that the man with his experience with Jesus, how he identified Jesus. And so throughout this text, we see the grace of God. All throughout, we see it, right? And so we can offer grace to others who may see Jesus based on their experience with God in different ways. But then notice as, his, as he grew in relationship with Jesus and God in verses 38 and 39, he said, he changed it. He said, Lord, he called him Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. So Jesus didn't give up on him. He kept on, he healed his eyes. And then he approached him, he saw him, he saw that he was blind, he had a need, he healed him. And then, after that, in verse 35, it says, Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, so Jesus found the man. It's like thinking about the prevenient grace of God. Jesus finds us, Jesus seeks us, God seeks us. And God will redefine our ways of worship and ministry. We're living that now. So we're back in the gym. But it doesn't, God is still God to us. This is still the house of God. It's a church. You know, it's sacred. We're in this space. But remember when the Pharisees, you know, they were the experts of the law. And they were saying, they were more focused on Jesus healing and Sabbath as opposed to, okay, this man was healed and he you know, receive a miracle from Jesus. But God will redefine our ways of worship and ministry. He'll do that for us, whether we want to or not. And also what we can see is God will put people in our lives for accountability. Because we may not be able to see ourselves. And it's important to be accountable. Have somebody that can pray with you, tell you, redirect you, tell you when you're wrong. Tell you when you're doing right. But we cannot be in ministry or be disciples on our own. Verses 40 and 41 says, Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, We see your sin remains. So that was them accountability. Jesus making them see themselves. The Pharisees, you know, like I said earlier, they're the experts of the law. So they appear to have all the answers, but they did not read the Bible. And then also what we learn in this story is to be persistent, consistent, and this man was. And he had faced all kind of, you know, when you know, you know, right? And so he was being questioned, but he knew what Jesus did for him. He knew. His experience with Jesus. Even to the point of, you know, like his parents even said, I don't know. But he knew. He couldn't explain everything, but he knew. And so, remember in our, our other text that we have this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 16. I won't read the scripture, you can read it in your own personal uh, time of study. And you know, you're familiar with it. It's when um, Samuel anoints David, and after Saul was rejected for being king because he was disobedient uh, to God. And so Samuel was sure that it was the firstborn, right, of the sons that were in Bethlehem he knew. But God corrected him. He redefined even Samuel, or how Samuel thought of it. And so, as we know, how it turned out, it ended up being David, who was the youngest son. 
And there was nothing spectacular about David. We see, we know that in the scripture. And um, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, well, I'll read verse 6 first. It says, when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of the stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward, outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So redefine even how Samuel saw it, who was going to be supposed to be king, why right? it was going to be who Samuel was supposed to anoint as king. So and we know the story of Jesus and Jesus' bloodline and genealogy and David was part of that bloodline and that genealogy. I want to tell you a story in my closing. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised and we held him of no account. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. But by perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken from the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet, it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. But out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear, bear, bear iniquity. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressions. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. transgressors excuse me. This is from Isaiah chapter 53. And this is the story of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who redefined our lives when he lived, he suffered and he died for us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So in the absence of our pastor and ordained minister, and I am not in the place of providing an invitation to Christian discipleship, but um, if you would like to reaffirm your faith or uh, if you want to join, it's like our church family here, but if you want to join people online, they want to become a part of this ministry or another church, or it doesn't have to, you don't have to necessarily be a member of this church, but, uh, even if you want somebody to talk to you about your faith, your faith or your relationship with Jesus Christ, please contact the church office. Thank you.
thank DeAndra for that uplifting message. I think she kind of alluded to it, but uh, DeAndra has been uh, named and approved as a candidate for the ministry for the Methodist Church. So in honor of DeAndra, we're having a little reception right after service. It says upstairs, but we're having it down here since everybody's already downstairs. So you can uh, grab something before you leave today. And um, if you'd like to have a few words for DeAndra, that'd be uh, great too. Um, we'll prepare ourselves for our morning offering, our offertory prayer. God of abundance, you fill us with good things, you satisfy our thirst, you meet our every need. From your rock, our blessings flow. Accept what we give in return, our hearts, our hands, our gifts, our love. Use them to answer the cries of the world in need. Amen. We ask for our offer for stewards to come forward.
before I dismiss the light, I would just uh, like to make a correction that the church council will not meet on Tuesday. Thank you, Sister Condra. Once again, I'm so grateful to be here before you. And thank you for inviting me here to speak. And I just pray that God will with you, be with you this week. And um, so for our Lindy of Sandy, in the spirit of the women who survived the Middle Passage, withstood and overcame the oppression of slavery, we go forth, heading north, in the spirit of women who dared obstacles and challenged unjust barriers and forged new peoples in new lands. We go forth, heading south, in the spirit of women who refused to be browbeaten and held back and opened the new paths for others to follow. We go forth, heading east, in the spirit of women who refused to be shut out and demolished boundaries to open new spaces to sisters unborn. We go forth, heading west. We go forth, moving in all directions, moving at the directive of the Holy One, moving boldly and courageously in the assurance of divine guidance, anointing presence, and enabling power in the spirit, not only of our ancestors and the sisterhood, but at the direction of the sister wisdom, Sophia, who calls each and all to encourage her for the sake of God's glory. We go forth, we go forth. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.